Okay, folks, we are going to get started. I uh, hope you all can hear me. Um, my name is Phil White. I am the Earth Science and Geospatial Data Librarian here at the University of Colorado Boulder. I'm coming, coming to you from the map library here in Boulder. Um, we are all very excited for GIS Day today. And uh, we have a really, um, really great lineup of speakers. Uh, I want to introduce to, um, to everyone all of our organizers for today first. And I want to send a huge thanks to all of them. Um, Jen Ambrose from University of Colorado, Denver. Alicia Cowart, also from the University of Colorado, Denver. Diane Fritz is from University of Colorado, Denver, as well as the Auraria Library. There she is. Uh, Sarah Kelly is here with me in person. She is from the uh, geography department uh, here at CU Boulder. Matt Godfrey, I didn't did not forget you. Matt is at uh, the University of Colorado, Colorado Springs, and um, and then there's me. So um, want to run through a couple of quick things just before we jump into our keynote. Um, we like to do a land acknowledgement. So uh, as we gather, we want to honor and acknowledge that the University of Colorado's four campuses are on the traditional territories and ancestral homelands of the Cheyenne, Arapaho, Ute, Apache, Comanche, Kiowa, Lakota, Pueblo, and Shoshone nations. Further, we acknowledge the 48 contemporary tribal nations historically tied to the lands that comprise what is now called Colorado. Want to run through our schedule real quick. Uh, getting started here in just a couple of minutes is Rafael Moreno, our keynote speaker. At 11 o'clock, we have an open source showcase presented by Kurt Menke. Uh, we will be having a career panel at noon. At one o'clock, we'll take a 30 minute break. And at 1.30, we have an ArcGIS Insights demonstration from uh, some kind folks at Esri, Brianna Wittick and Melissa Thompson. Following that, we have several lightning talks coming up. So we hope uh, you'll join us for as many of this as you like. Uh, and right now, oh, oh one more thing. Uh, we'll be using Zoom for questions for our presenters, unless you're in person. Uh, if you're online, um, please, when, you're, when you uh, have a question, you can enter it in anytime in the chat. Uh, we'll be doing questions at the end, uh, but when you put it in the chat, just put question um, in front of it so that we know this is something you want to ask our speaker. Um, make sure that you're muted as well. Uh, we do have a website. It's at this link, bit.ly slash GIS day underscore 2022. We'll take you to all of the speaker information. So you can go visit that uh, whenever you like throughout the day to check our calendar. Uh, and with that out of the way, uh, Rafael Moreno is going to um, start our keynote and I am going to step aside and uh, let the introduction take place. So I'm going to stop sharing and let you all take charge. All right. Can everyone on Zoom hear me? Yes. 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 Okay. Great. <laughs> I'm Alicia Cowart. I am the director of the Geospatial Analysis and Mapping Lab here at CU Denver. And it's my pleasure to introduce Dr. Rafael Moreno. He is a professor in the Department of Geography and Environmental Sciences here at CU Denver as well. Uh, he has taught courses in GI science and technology, environmental science, land use planning, and sustainability and natural resources management since 1996. We are very excited to have him as our keynote speaker today for GIS Day, where he will be talking about the importance of openness in the context of geographic information science and technology and sustainable development. Please join me in welcoming Dr. Rafael Moreno. Thank you, Alicia, very kind. Uh, so thank you everyone for being here, taking the time from your busy schedules, uh, those of you online and here 
present. Thank you so much for being here. And Cheers Day. Cheers Day is only second to Christmas Day, right? <laughs> In terms of the excitement and the fun and the things that happens. And uh, that's part of why this field is very attractive, among other things we're going to talk about today. So I also want to, Phil already did the recognition of the organizing uh, uh, committee, but uh, I just want to mention them with their lovely faces, smiley faces always, and to thank them for uh, not only organizing this event, but, but, but for their energy and knowledge that bring to our institutions that is, uh, is highly, highly appreciated. So thank you so much, all of you. And uh, Bill has already mentioned the, 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 each of them where they work and roughly what they do. So thank you again. And thank you for the distinction and honor to allow me to participate today. So let's uh, talk a little bit uh, about what's the aim of, of the next few minutes we'll share together and is to have some thoughts about the connection between openness, geographic information science and sustainable development. So what happens when we apply the philosophy of openness in the area of GIS science and technology and how that relates to the achievement or moving towards sustainable development. So, again, all right. So briefly, what we're gonna cover today is about some characteristics of today's sustainable development challenges, just a refresher. We all have heard about them. We know about them just to uh, point some issues that are directly connected to GI science and technology and openness. Then define openness because all of us probably we have heard about open these and open that, but maybe we have heard a little bit less about the philosophy of openness. And then what are the effects of applying openness within the area of GIS sensor technology. And we're gonna mention two specific cases, which is applying openness within uh, the creation of open specifications and the creation of free and open source software. Then we're gonna also, we know, and we have heard so many definitions of sustainable development. There is over a hundred definitions of sustainable development. I'm just gonna pick one so that we can connect it directly to the issues that we're gonna be talking about also. And then try to summarize the match that exists between the needs to move towards sustainable development and the open resources, processes, and effects within GIS science and technology. So finally, we'll talk about a, a very interesting case of using uh, applying openness within GIS science and technology, which is the case of the United Nations Open GIS Initiative. So what is that, why is important and so on and so forth. So that's 21st century as we all know is the century of rapid change. Change in the environment, societies, economies, problems, all kinds of things happening really, really fast, right? So this also creates a lot of complexity. And now we are in a more powerful, uh, more, powerful uh, um, position to recognize as well as embrace the complexity, right? So we are able to do something about it, analyze it, recognize it. And that's something that is, is pretty unique to this century. Well, with this situation also, we have to try to crack the nut of sustainable development. How are we gonna move towards it? So among the things we have to do is work on adaptation, efficiency and resiliency. And now we have to do that in a better, faster way. So why are we into GIS science and technology? So most of us that are here, probably we are already inside the tent of GIS science and technology, but something that I was commenting with my friends of the organizing committee is we need to talk to the ones that are outside of the tent or away from at the table, we want to bring them in, right? So that's why in this, in this presentation, I try to keep it basic and general because sometimes uh, what is kind of intuitive to us is news to, to the folks that are just trying to bring into the area of GIS science and technology. So why are we into GIS and technology? Well, because it's powerful, it's interesting, it's fun, right? And 
But one other reason is because it situates us in a very unique position to provide significant contributions to move towards sustainable development. That's one of the, uh, of the very important reasons, in my opinion, why GIS and technology is a very important field and why many people are coming in into the field of GIS science and technology. So sustainable development must be conceptualized, studied and addressed using, as we know, multidisciplinary, multi-scale, system thinking, special teaching approaches, all of those together, right? So we all have heard about the multidisciplinary approaches, the system thinking approach, the multi-scale approach and the and spatial thinking approach, but I'm just gonna touch briefly in the multi-scale approach and the issue, which is very important and creates a lot of complexity is that also these sustainable development challenges have to consider multiple stakeholders with very diverse backgrounds all over the world locally, right? So next, well, of course, this situation, this need to address these problems in that way creates complex interconnected issues, which is the core definition of what is a wicked problem, right? So wicked problems are problems that are difficult or impossible to solve and that they are complex and interconnected. So this is the, the challenge that we're facing. Right. So let's talk about briefly about multi-scale. So we have to consider different types of scales, such as the special scale, the temporal scale, the jurisdictional scale, the institutional scale, and the technological scale. So we have to think at the same time about all these different scales and not only that, to make things a lot more fun, we have to consider the intra and cross scale interactions and effects. So what happens when we have interactions within different levels, uh, different levels within the same scale and also cross scale interactions and effects, right? So if, you, if we can think, for example, of federal agencies like the Forest Service or the National Park Service, that manage natural and cultural resources, they have to be thinking along all those scales and all the interactions, such as special scale, we have to manage and think from the stand level to the forest level, to the landscape level, to the planetary level, that's different levels of recreation in space. And then we have to think for five years, 10 years, 50 years, sometimes a hundred years, right? And then we have the mess of who controls what, the jurisdiction. They have to manage areas that have proper, private property, tribal lands, federal lands, state parks, so on and so forth, right? And then we have the technological scale in which we have folks that all we have is paper and pencil and some other that are huge with the latest technology in everything and sophisticated everything. So all of that has to be considered. And of course, it creates complexity, interconnectedness, and wicked problems, right? So the second point is the issue of trying to bring to the table diverse stakeholders. So these stakeholders are very diverse because they are located in all over the place from next door neighbor to other state to other country, not other planet yet but one day, right? So they are located all over the place and we have to bring them to the table, right? Uh, these stakeholders, they have diverse sociocultural, economic, financial, political, institution, technological, and educational context. And so that's, we cannot have a one size fits all and we have to be very capable to address each situation, each context very specifically. And of course, almost always we have the situation that these stakeholders have conflicting priorities, interests and agendas. So this creates again, all the complexity, wicked problems of sustainable development. So these challenges will require are the application, bring to bear the best science and diverse systems and technologies. 
So keyword diversity and technology, we cannot be just trained, educated, or capable of applying one type of technology. We have to bring many different kinds because the problems are very diverse. So we have to include proprietary closed solutions as well as open solutions and others that might be necessary. Uh, to address the data, information, knowledge, and decision-making support that is necessary to tackle the problems of sustainable development. So I recommend you this paper by Maxwell, the, all the references are at the end of the slides in which he does a very nice, clear uh, uh, presentation of the balance and the importance of keeping a balance uh, in creating value and innovation in applying proprietary so, uh, closed solutions um, and open solutions at the same time. So let's talk briefly, uh, define what is openness. Openness is a philosophy, that's the first point, right? And that is characterized by transparency and no cost unrestricted access, access to data, information, knowledge, and technologies. And it also entails the commitment to sharing and to a collaborative and cooperative approach to the development management and decision-making, right? So from this point forward, Every time you see an orange fund, those are concepts or issues that are key to sustainable development. So for sustainable development, transparency, lower cost, sharing, collaborative work are essential. Okay. So from now on, everything you see in orange, it will be that we keep it there. And at the end, I do a summary, but by then there's going to be a long, long list. Okay. All right. So openness, the, the University Consortium for GIS Science and the, uh, GIS Science, University Consortium for Geographic Information Science, that you, you might have heard of the Body of Knowledge uh, digital publication, has a whole entry on openness. What is openness? Uh, what are the issues with openness? So you can check it out. And then as we were saying, openness is applied in many different fields in, in, in different ways, such as open source software, open data, open standards, open government, open innovation, open access, open education, and the list is pretty long, okay? So these many areas of application of openness, we need to have a structure to try to make sense of how are they connected and how they relate to each other. So this, this structure is proposed by Slime wine, and hopefully I'm not killing that last name. Those of you that probably know German or some uh, language, you will do better. But uh, he proposes this structure to see how, how uh, uh, the different areas of application of openness are related. So we have as foundation the philosophy of openness, which is based on collaboration, inclusiveness, access, participation, participatory development, and decision making. That's the philosophy. And then we have when we apply that philosophy, we create open resources, such as open data and open source code and, and, and open access, for example, right? So we have res open resources. Then we have open processes, processes that are participatory, inclusive, example, crowdsourcing, right? And so when we use open resources in combination with open processes, we end up with an openness effect. So an impact of openness, right? And that could be facilitation of access, democratization, transparency, equality, right? So this, is, this structure helps us to think about all this field of openness and how it relates to each other. The other thing that is important to recognize is that the different areas of application of openness create important interactions and synergies. So when we apply the whole life cycle of of open technologies and science, we have more impacts, greater impacts than just applying open data inside a closed system and, and, and so on. Why openness is important? Oh, the list is very, very long. <laughs> and so, because it all depends where are you applying it? And I just put a short list there of explains uh, why open is important in the area of open data, free and open source software, open access, open education, and open government. That's just a short list to, to, to because each of them has brings up different, different topics. 
So let's talk about two, two areas, two points in which uh, uh, of the application of, of openness in GIS sensor technology. One is the area of open standards and the other is the free and open source software for your special applications. So how, what, what is it that happens when we apply openness in these two, two aspects? So we, we might have heard all about OGC, the Open Geospatial Consortium, and the issue of open standards, right? So the OGC is an international consortium that aims to make geospatial information and services fair. Fair means findable, accessible, interoperable, and reusable. Now, that's pretty cool how they come up with this thing because you know the word fair as acronyms right there you get it okay i'm being fair right but if you go on a little bit deeper it's like i i mean findable accessible interoperable and reusable right and then again orange means that those terms are fundamental to sustainable development right so through the creation development and distribution of your special standards that enable the the, the, the creation of fair resources so for those of, of, of you that might be starting in, in the area of geosense and technology, this is in a nutshell how it works. We have developers that uh, are distributed around the world. You know, it could be in China, here in the United, United States or Europe. And they're working together, but they have never met or, or talked to each other ever, but they agree to use open standards in their work. So when they use open standards, what happens is that they start creating open interfaces and encodings encodings for data, right? And other interfaces for software or services. And then that enables that these components can work together in a seamless way. So we have, a, a, and at the end enables the creation of findable, accessible, interoperable and reusable resources and services, right? So check out their website because they do more than the, than the open standards. A uh, really fascinating thing, if you have not done in the past, uh, they're kind of doing all kinds of best practices, very useful stuff. Let's talk about a second area of application, briefly a second area of application of, of uh, openness, and is the free and open source software for your special applications. We have the pleasure and luck, and thanks to the work of the organizing committee to have Kurt Menke next which is an awesome guy, very well known in the area of QGIS, as you will see. Uh, uh, he has done uh, significant contributions to that software. So the, eco the, the Phosphor G uh, ecosystem is big. There are many, many, many solutions for all the different niches in geospatial science and technology. And sometimes people find that overwhelming it's like oh which is the right desktop that i should use which is the right web server that i should use well there is there is the answer to that and it will be in this coming slide all right for example this is one way to put that ecosystem together there are many this is just one one case right and, and again we have we have uh, uh phosphor g is capable to address every niche every need uh, for your special science and technology. So from field data collection, desktop systems, database systems, web deployment systems, and libraries for application development, right? So this is just one way to put them together. And of course, as we will see later, there is the, o the OSGO uh, uh, Foundation, which tries to say, look, these are the, more, the ones that are more advanced that have been sanctioned or revised by us or coordinated by us. And, you can trust uh, uh, these, these solutions. We'll get there. Now, the other thing that Phosphor G sometimes when we're new to, to, to this uh, uh, area of the geospatial technology is that we think because it's free, how good could it be? You know, you pay what you get. So now, I mean, uh, Phosphor G is extremely capable. It is mature and they are mission critical, sophisticated applications fully based on Phosphor G uh, free and open source software. If you go to Europe, for example, it's a lot more common to find whole institutions, big ones, government, uh, management resources, institution, universities, fully based on, on open source solutions. So uh, this is just one example, the reference is down there at the bottom, check it out. There is a detailed explanation there of how these uh, uh, special data infrastructure works. 
Also, again, the University Consortium for Geospatial Science has dedicated a whole entry just to how Phosphor-G is developed. Very interesting work by Petra Smitasova, the folks in North Carolina, very, very interesting group there. Uh, um, and they put a very nice explanation how it works, how they develop in a collaborative distributed way open source software. Now, what are some, some of the reasons that we should use uh, uh, or consider or get educated or learn more about Phosphor G? Because again, we're facing a more diverse, complex challenges and we need to be more flexible, more adaptable, more capable in different dimensions. So, these are, so that we can address different contexts in the technological, the social, cultural, economic and institution, right? Some contexts are not going to be appropriate for private cloud solutions, and some contexts are not going to be appropriate for full uh, Phosphor-G solutions. Sometimes we have to go hybrid, as we will see in the last example of today. It fosters Phosphor-G, the work with Phosphor-G, the development of Phosphor-G, the deployment of Phosphor-G for your systems, fosters local capacity, self-sufficiency, reliance, resilience, reduction of risks, stability, democracy, equal access, lowers barriers to entry, strengthening social networks and cooperation, among others. Every one of these words is key to sustainable development. Also, particularly for educators, it helps to develop a different way of learning, thinking, and solving IT and special problems. This is what, what I tend to look the way of the hacker. I, I have gotten rid of that thing because I think has put me in cold water sometimes because hacker might have some negative connotations <laughs> in certain circles, right? So I used to say, this is the way of the hacker, you know, be more proactive on your own, collaborate, network. That's the way of the hacker, right? And so, but yeah, that's it. <laughs> so other reasons is that it might reduce cost and there is a whole article by NASA that uh, explains why it reduces cost and why sometimes it does not reduce cost and it might increase cost. Uh, because you can deploy whole special data infrastructures based on, on open uh, source software. And also because again, we are facing a more diverse, complex, integrated context and problems. And hence it requires better and more diverse geospatial science and technologies, okay? So OSGO, again, you have not had the chance to be exposed to, to OSGO. It's important to check them out because their aim is, is a nonprofit organization that their mission is to foster global adoption of open geospatial technology by being inclusive and applying open philosophy and also applying participation and creation of our community. So you'll see that those are the OS, uh, the projects that the OSGO oversees or coordinates. And you can see that there are names that might look familiar to you, very powerful uh, systems. The other organization you want to keep an eye is uh, geo for all which is an international network of labs, universities, private institutions, and others that are dedicated focus to education and, and development of Phosphor-G. So check their website. As you can see, where is the largest concentration of this type of organizations is Europe. So uh, Phosphor-G is not for the poor, okay, <laughs> necessarily, which is another conception that people might think, oh, those are for the ones that cannot pay, right? So that's not necessarily the case. So quickly, some things of what is sustainable development. Again, we all have heard the Broadland report, right? That is, is the one about uh, fulfill our needs without hindering the capacity of future generations to fulfill their own needs. And when I, that, I asked that question, so my glasses would twist around the words because they, they kind of put one before the other and we change completely the meaning. That's why I stay away from it because I made that mistake all the time. So in a little bit more detail, sustainable development is not an end, but it's a process, okay? And the other thing is important, is a process that must include the management of change. 
So this is very important. And this is why GIS and technology is very powerful because it allows, give us very powerful capabilities for the management of change. We have, of course, to maintain the balance between fulfillment of human needs and preserving the natural systems of the planet to produce goods and services that allow us to fulfill our needs, right? And also the consideration of individuals and societies' capacity and improvement of capacity of learning, adaptability, and change. This is very, very important. Sometimes uh, it's, it's embedded out there, people that you know, they know it, but it's better to spell it out. And again, orange means this is key to sustainable development capacity of learning, adaptability, and change at a cost that is less, less than the value of, of the benefits, right? And again, those words are loaded because costs and values, benefits are not fully considered and saying it's not fair when we discard certain option because we say it's too expensive or it doesn't provide enough value. No, <laughs> the problem is that our accounting systems are bad right so there are many social benefits that are not quantifiable right such as increased capacity of learning how much money is that worth right and we say yeah oh, no you know that initiative is not good because it doesn't provide enough value all right so sustainable where requires governments companies scientists policymakers and citizens to work together in a transparent way, in a collaborative way, in an inclusive way, in a democratic way, facilitating access and distribution of information, knowledge and technologies. And all of these words, again, are core essential to the definition of the philosophy of openness and its applications, okay? So there is a very close match between openness in GIS science and technology and what is necessary towards sustainable development. So all of those orange words, I'm gonna to try to list them here, just a short list, and it's gonna be pretty long. Just to uh, uh, summarize how sustainable development and openness in GIS and technology are connected, related, and there is a match between them. So again, for sustainable development, we need to develop local capacity. We need to improve self-reliance. -reli we need to improve adaptability, reduce risks. And again, I wish we had time to touch well, how in the world reduce risk. Well, one of those risks is to be locked in a proprietary closed solution, in which it's very hard to get out of it or very expensive to get out of it. And that's a risk, right? Uh, reduction of vulnerabilities, same example of being stuck with a specific vendor. Uh, resilience, improve resilience, stability, democracy, transparency, equal access, strengthening of social networks. This is, this is very interesting. This is what is fun, right? Because people that are into GIS, they, they're really cool people, right? They like to make friends and talk about GIS, go to a GIS conference and they go GIS, GIS, GIS from six in the morning to midnight. You know, GIS six in the morning when they go running and midnight when they're having the last beer, right? And they still go in GIS for seven days. So that means it's really exciting stuff. So, and that creates networking that is very powerful, right? For all kinds of reasons, from the basic human connectivity to the knowledge and the connectivity that happens for knowledge and skill. Cooperation, increased learning capacity, uh, enablement of local capacity to fix and develop. Again, all of these things we all have heard about sustainable development, right? Creating uh, appropriate technology from a, the appropriate technology in a bucket to the appropriate technology in a special data infrastructure, right? So if we compare this list versus what we've been saying of the effects of openness in GIS sensor technology in regards to open standards, open standards allow transparent, inclusive, democratic, collaborative, and distributed development of software, data, and services. So you see how we can match those words to the words in the first column, right? Then the second case we mentioned is the issue of Phosphor-G and, and open data there. These, these technologies are not exclusionary, lower barriers to access, encourage communication and cooperation 
while strengthening social networks, as we were just saying, foster local learning develop and development of local capacities, which is very, very important. And by being fair, what is it? Findable, accessible, interoperable, and reusable, right? <laughs> I have to remind myself, <laughs> so don't worry, it's not a test. I have to remind myself, but it's pretty cool. We say, hey, fair, uh, if you don't know how the spelling is because you're not in the know. <laughs> okay, so um, reduce waste, uh, these reduce fair resources and technologies reduce waste and time uh, of time and effort. All right, so to close, an example of this is the UN Open GIS Initiative. If you have not had a chance to pick on it, uh, there is a reference to, the, to, to an article by Brovelli and Eom. Eom is in the UN, Brovelli is in the Polytechnico Milan. Really interesting that they go in detail about these things, what entails, where they are, how they move in, and so on and so forth. So this is a great example because it doesn't get more global than this. It doesn't get more complex than this. It doesn't get more interconnected than this. And according to a statement we will see later, the best way to address this complexity and interconnectivity is by hybrid infrastructure. So something that combines the best of both worlds, the closed world, uh, proprietary world, and the open source world. It doesn't get more mission critical and sophisticated than what they do. Finding mines, cleaning mines, uh, mines, not mice, maybe mice too. <laughs> mines, uh, responding to emergency and disasters, it doesn't get more critical. People die if we don't do it fast and well, right? And what they're saying is to do it fast and well, we need a combination of open technologies and close proprietary technologies. So again, it doesn't get more sophisticated and complicated and more mission critical than this. So a quick overview of what they, they are doing. And again, please check out that article is really interesting. Um, they have five working groups. Uh, first one is on hybrid uh, GS infrastructure, capacity building, which is us, the education component, training component. Um, many organizations are doing awesome work on workshops, tutorial, videos, documents uh, in different languages, sometimes with just images. So it's very interesting work. Uh, geo, geospe geospatial analysis, geodata collection, and geospatial artificial intelligence. Right? Those are the working groups that they have. I'm just going to touch briefly on working group one, which is the hybrid GIS infrastructure. And that's the brief uh, diagram of how they are conceptualizing this, this uh, infrastructure. And as you see in the green, we have open uh, technologies. And in the right, we have proprietary cross technologies, in this case, ESRI products and systems, right? So at the, again, from the bottom in the database, we have open, an open technology like PostgreSQL, PostGIS, right? And we have our case DE from the ESRI side. Then on the ESRI side, we have portal. Maybe you have heard about what portal does is the deployment to create web portals, right? Uh, desktop, uh, RTS Pro now and mobile solutions, you know, they, what they call their field solutions, right? And we're gonna have a demonstration by a group of those folks over there. Um, by the way, Esri, I, I, you know, is, I love the company and I rec we have many friends that work there. Uh, Jack Darmanmon has been an incredible, generous person, but personally to me, I can tell you if we have time a cool story about that. <laughs> and then, uh, so yeah, it is not, it's not, it's not sometimes what is the devil versus the good guys, right? So it's something that we have to, to see beyond that simplistic dichotomy. And again, they are saying, the experts are saying it is the best to support uh, the UN operations and hybrid uh, infrastructure because it's cost-effective, flexible, scalable, it uh, allows the creation of innovations faster, cheaper, and, uh, and it adds social value. And, and you go like, sometimes you can say, well, oh, social value, what does that mean? Well, imagine just the, the incredible value that is to train, educate, make people independent in some location, 
It doesn't have to be in the middle of a developing country. It could be in the middle of a developing neighborhood here in Denver, right? They have uh, uh, situations that are very different from the average. So other component of this initiative is pilot projects. And this is the list of project projects that they have. As you can see, they're using, for example, story maps to illustrate the work that they do in Sudan. Uh, but also, I will touch briefly on, on, on the data collection, field collection, that is, they are testing different geospatial solutions, right? And this is the one, the pilot project on mobile, mobile uh, open GIS. And as you can see, they're testing some open solutions for field data collection, such as uh, QField, um, GeoPaparazzi, um, and uh, Kobo Toolbox. So, and that's how they make the work all together and connect them. And, uh, and again, in the article, they talked more in detail of how they make this thing work. All right, perfect, we're on time, we made it. <laughs> I usually run over. Don't give me the microphone ever, okay? <laughs> so, final thoughts. Uh, Today, more than ever, uh, the geospatial professional has to have a clear, good understanding of the geographic information science that underpins the technologies that we're using. We need to understand how they emerge and what they use under the hood, okay? But also we need to have a good understanding of the societal, implications of the use of these technologies. What happens if we bring to bear artificial intelligence? Sometimes we discriminate people unintentionally or intentionally, right? And or ethics, those kinds is the domain of geographic information studies. So the society's implications of the use of the technologies, we need to be well grounded on this, in this knowledge, okay? Also, we need to increase and diversify our knowledge and skills. We cannot be any more unidimensional in the open source world or in the proprietary cloud world. We have to be in both and others, okay? Because, we are, because of all the reasons we have talked about. We are facing different contexts, different situations that need custom-made solutions that might involve different types of technologies, right? So, and also all of these, why do we do it? Just because it's a lot of fun, because we work with cool people and it's awesome. And sometimes we get well paid, why, right? No, I think at the end of the day, we say, because I'm having in a small way, significant contributions to move towards sustainable development within my realm of activities, right? And that's all we do in life. All we do in life is try to get better forever as individuals, families, and societies, and economies. That's sustainable development, get better forever. Not get bigger, <laughs> uh, but get better, right? More efficient. And of course, like Spider-Man said, with great power, it comes great responsibility. And we, in particular, us here in university, you guys as the next generation, we have a big, big responsibility because we have a lot of power to make a difference, right? So we're counting on you guys <laughs> to save the world. And the best way to uh, predict the future is to create it. And you guys, we are all uh, creating it with our work and, and our enthusiasm. And again, thank you so much for taking the time to be here today. Thank you to the organizing committee again for not only this work, but for all the work that you do every day that I that is so valuable to keep the excitement going and uh, uh, having GI science and technology be fun and cool. <laughs> right, thank you. We have some time for um questions. And Jen, I don't know if you want to bring them up here so you can say the question and have it heard over Zoom, if that's possible. So. Hello. 
Right. So Dr. Moreno, if you want to read as I Say it out loud. Um, I, can't, I don't have my glasses. Oh, that's, okay. that's great. I'm happy to read it out loud for everyone. All right, so we have a question. Um, I'm in a situation just beginning with great interest in an open solution to mapping some data, but the primary partners and stakeholders are government who use Esri products. Can you say anything about working in both back and forth between an open system and the proprietary system? Wow, that, that, that's a great question and a common situation. And here there are some folks that face it, like the lady there is doing an internship with the National Park Service and she can uh, experience that firsthand. Uh, yeah, that's a common situation. And I have many fr good friends in, in the National Park Service for a service of other agencies, USGS. And I ask them, very smart people, they are aware of the, of the free and open source uh, uh, solutions, but it's a complicated thing because there is a lot of history. There is a lot of legacy work and legacy data uh, that, uh, uh, that exist. I mean, we're talking about 40 years of, of something. And then you know how it is. I've been building this thing, don't touch it <laughs> because it could get out of whack. That's one potential situation uh, that, that why is it, they, they are going slowly towards it. And yes, they're taking a look at it, definitely. Actually, I was talking with Dr. Diane Fritz on the way here that uh, one of the speakers that they got, Greg Matthews, is leading. He created about 15 years ago at the USGS, a group that is fully dedicated to assess how can uh, crowdsource data for, through OpenStreetMap can be incorporated into authoritative data sets published by the USGS. And they've been working for these uh, for 15 years, okay? So how can we make it, is it reliable? We will not kill anyone. And so they are looking at it. There's no doubt about it, but it's gonna, something is gonna take time. So depending on which organization you're looking at and at what level, at what stage of development or systems they are, the possibilities of using open solutions in combination with private closed solutions in a federal agency or a government agency might be different. But, but it's happening. And, and my personal opinion for the reasons I presented is that this is going to be not only necessary, but almost mandated that we have to be more flexible. Example, the UN, right? So that's, that's what I will say to, to that question, uh, which is excellent. All right. Jen, yeah, I'm always a fan of personal experiences. So can you share some of your spatial experiences utilizing open products or open concepts in space work management or anything like that? Anything comes to mind? Ooh, many. But for example, the most recent, um, I just had a, a PhD student from Mexico and she's doing her PhD in forestry. I, I, I have the honor to be on her PhD committee down there. And her work is in, in expert systems and decision support system for forest management. Um, so she's creating these systems for an ejido, a, a communal property in Northern Mexico. And this, this communal property says, look, they're very smart and also they are educating this community to say, look, you have to be self-reliant, independent, all that, everything we listed. They are telling you have to be because I, I might be gone, the people are developing, and we want to leave you with something that you can live with on your own. Very challenging thing because they are talking about very sophisticated, uh, you know, mathematical optimization stuff. Uh, so yeah, it's, it's, it's the, that's the aim. But the whole, all that work is based on open source solutions. So that from creating the spatial data infrastructure to customizing the optimization systems, uh, the, the customizing the decision support systems, putting all these things together and then deploy it and handle it into a, a, a rural community in the middle of nowhere in the mountains of Oaxaca. Did I say Northern Mexico? No, it's in Oaxaca. <laughs> okay, so uh, in the state of Oaxaca. 
Yeah, I, I said Northern Mexico because the origins of, uh, and a lot of that works in Durango in the north. So, uh, yeah, there is one example, right? So, so again, it could go from addressing the most basic uh, needs in a very uh, not developed technological context, such as a rural community in the forests of Mexico, to creating a very sophisticated decision support system with optimization modules that creates all the harvesting progress. I have a question. Um, so you spoke about the UN and their idea of having a mix of proprietary and open source things to build to have good solutions. And then the UN also has their sustainable, sustainable development goals that are out there. And I'm wondering about students that want to target one of those specific goals with geospatial if there is some kind of website or committee or structure where they can start connecting what they know to those sustainable development goals and what the UN is saying about geospatial to actually try and get involved or, or to keep track of the projects that the UN is conducting for those goals. Yeah, that's a great, another great solution. Like how do we merge the, the, what this group of the Open GIS is doing to the specific achievement of each of the UN development goals? Uh, there are many, many places. It's, I mean, this is scattered all over the place and one has to keep tracking the crumbs and put it together. But yeah, information is out there. Um, actually, I took out one slide about a, a project called a Goddam project, which probably a, a guy in, uh, in England, uh, Suchit Anand, really great guy, super enthusiastic, another super GIS. -er. He's always, you know, putting out there, hey, we need to bring open data to agriculture and nutrition and food safety. That's a Godan project. And I took it out because I was afraid I was <laughs> running out of time. But that's one connection, for example, nutrition and, uh, issue. There is a clear connection of open source to, to, to one of the goals. So starting at the UN Sustainable Development Goals, that their webpage that they have, like that's a good red, all of breadcrumbs and then find potential projects. Yeah. That you might be, yeah, or at least to spark your idea of where you might want to be applying yep. geospatial in those spaces. Yes, that, that's, I agree, yes, completely. So we've maybe got time for one more question um, from the remote audience. So do you see FOS4G used much in colleges and universities? Should we have a national effort to organize FOS4G educators? Yes, yes, and yes. <laughs> I mean, I spent part of my sabbatical in the Polytechnic of Milan in Italy uh, five, six years ago. And I was impressed that all the teachers is in open source stuff. All the teaching. So they have some stuff with, with Esri products, but most of the things is open source uh, in the class, intro to GIS, GIS analysis, uh, deployment of GIS on the web, all of that is with open source tools. Uh, and so, and then through them, I learned that folks in Switzerland, France, uh, Spain, uh, Germany, uh, basically all over the place in the universities, they are a heavy component of your special education for, for uh, because they say we we want to educate our people, not necessarily train them or train them and educate them with a balance, right? So yes, the, for the reasons that that we talked about today, uh, uh, yes, we need to incorporate more of that so that the future generations are more capable, more diverse, uh, uh, that, that can address more uh, different complex contexts. So that idea that the person brings up of creating a national network of, of uh, coordination, that's the idea of geo for all, you know? And so check them out, it's, an, it's even international, but yeah, it wouldn't hurt to have, you know, a local national levels uh, of uh, coordinated and then coordinate with geo for all to do what this, what this uh, participant says. So yeah, great, great point. And, and, and again, with that, we need to get ready for Kurt, which is gonna be awesome, I guarantee you. And then uh, again, thank you to the organizing committee. Thank you to all of you for your time and attention. And uh, please reach out I, as, as, as we all good GISs, we love to talk about GIS.
Thank you, guys.